Hi, my name is Aaron Cato, and I'm the Extension Specialist for Fruits and Vegetables for Integrated Pest Management at the University of Arkansas. Thanks for joining us today for our first virtual field walk. And my name is Amanda McCourt. I'm a horticulture production specialist with the University of Arkansas. And today we're going to be touring the University of Arkansas Vegetable Research Station in Kibler. Uh, we're also going to take a quick trip down to the Fruit Research Station in Clarksville, Arkansas. We're going to be touring strawberry research plots and we'll hopefully give you an up-close view of what we are seeing in the field. So let's go ahead and get started. So before we get started talking about the varieties we are evaluating, I want to give you all some background on this trial. This is what we call plastic culture production. So you'll look here and see that all of these plants are planted into a plastic raised bed. Underneath this black plastic we have drip irrigation um, that's run down the middle of the bed. This type of system is pretty typical for most of strawberry production in the southeast. Uh, within the system we typically plant small plug plants in the fall, usually between uh, or usually before about the first or second week of October, and we allow them to establish during the fall. It's really important to get that good establishment in the fall because how big the plants grow during that period has a big impact on determining how much flowering and fruit production they do in the spring. Typically here in Arkansas, we're looking at blooms starting in March or April, and then we're harvesting from about April to May, and sometimes into June. It's about 30 days from a bloom to a ripe strawberry. All right, so here in this trial, we have nine different cultivars planted. We do have four replications of each of these cultivars. Uh, and what I wanna do today is walk through and talk about each one of those. Um, these plants were planted on September 30th of 2019 using plugs uh, and then have been managed using a standard fertility and pest management program as recommended in the Southeast Pest Management uh, Spray Guides and Production Guides. I do want to point out that on November 11th and 12th of 2019, we had a major freeze event where temperatures dropped down to the 20s uh, to teens. And this was really the first cold that we had experienced uh, in the fall of 2019. And so the plants really hadn't been acclimated yet. Uh, and due to rainfall that was coming, we weren't able to uh, cover the plants with row covers to protect them. So we did see some cold injury that happened to the plants um, early on in their life cycle. We went through and actually cut open crowns in the fall uh, and assessed them for damage and assigned a rating. Um, so our rating scale went from zero to three, zero being no damage, uh, one being minor damage, two being uh, kind of moderate damage, some, some real browning or darkening of the crown, and the three being very severe damage uh, and uh, some necrosis. So using that rating scale, we did go through in the fall um, and kind of do an assessment across the different varieties to see how susceptible they were to the cold damage. Our average rating across all of the varieties was 2.19 using that scale. So we did have some pretty significant damage. We did come back again in the spring and reassess and we did see that a lot of them grew out of it. We've also done plant biomass samples several times and we are gonna be collecting data on yield and fruit soluble solids. Uh, we are kind of in the early part of the season, and so today we really just want to walk through and kind of show you what the plants look like, what the fruit looks like, uh, and cut open some berries and show you the internal fruit color and make some comments about what we've been seeing so far. So let's get started. So we're going to walk through and look at each one of the nine varieties that we have in this trial. But before we get started, I do want to remind everyone that we need to kind of think about what we're seeing here within the context of the conditions happening at this location and some of the other things that have gone on in the season. So of course we've had um, that cold event that happened November 11th to 12th, and that's definitely affected how some of these plants have grown off. We've also had a very wet season, so above average rainfall from the fall of 2019, continuing on into 2020. We've also had some hail damage recently, um, and we are seeing that on the leaves and the berries. So if we look down uh, through some of these plants, we see some tears in the leaves, uh, and then we see some marks on the fruit where uh, the berries have been damaged by hail. And I also want to point out that this location is pretty windy um, as we look across this, you know, and you can probably hear it in some of our microphones that there's a lot of wind here. And so that's definitely affecting uh, the plants to some degree and plants may be a little bit more dried out and stressed. So let's go ahead and get started with our first variety. And this is Camino Real. Camino Real released from the University of California in 2001 you know, pretty widely planted in Arkansas uh, because of good shelf life and yields. Last fall, when we were looking at runner production, uh, pretty similar runner production to Chandler um, at about 1.5 runners per plant. And if we dig down and start looking at some of the fruit, you know, um, 
pretty good uniform berry shape. Um, some nice sized berries in here for sure, and a lot of green small fruit that are coming along. Definitely been harvesting off of this for a little while. Um, it's not one of our earliest varieties. A lot of buds though still there. We did see some cold damage on this variety, but um, pretty good recovery. When we look into the fruit color, um, pretty good coloring uh, into the edges of the fruit, kind of a hollow center. Overall, I would say this variety maybe didn't have quite the plant biomass that we would like to see, um, but there are still some blooms in there that are coming along. We'll continue to evaluate community rail as we move forward. Our next variety is one that probably everyone is familiar with, and this is Chandler. Uh, this is kind of the standard variety that gets planted a lot in Arkansas and throughout the Southeast. It's really back in 1983 from University of California. Uh, for a Southern grown variety, it's thought to be quite cold hardy. Um, and we did observe that. And so it had the lowest average cold damage ratings uh, in the fall after the November 11th freeze. Again, our scale was from zero to three for cold damage, with zero being no damage and three being severe damage and some necrosis or some death of the crown. Chandler had an average rating of 1.5 in the fall um, when we were doing those assessments. And so that would be slightly above minor cold damage. Uh, when we biomassed in the late fall, um, these plants averaged about 1.75 crowns per plant. So definitely below ideal. And I think a lot of that is going back to that cold event in November, sending plants into an early dormancy. Let's dig down and start looking at some of the fruit uh, set here. Uh, you know, we still see a lot of blooms and buds in here. Um, starting to see um, some ripening fruit, you know, as we move through here, fruit size is maybe, you know, there's some medium sized berries in there, but maybe not the fruit set and size that we would like to see. Some possibly some pollination issues there as well. If we look into the fruit internal coloring, uh, this is a smaller berry for Chandler, um, but good, nice uh, red color through to the center. Okay, our next variety uh, is Albion. And this is the only day neutral that we were able to include in the trial this year. Um, released in 2006 from the University of California, known for being good, having good yields and some large attractive berries. If temperatures are mild into May and June, it can continue to produce. Um, there's some thinking that, of course, with the day neutral types, that you need to feed a little bit higher rate of nitrogen. And of course, um, it can have this variety in particular can have problems with two spotted spider mites, um, which is not untypical for a lot of the day neutral types. One thing that I do want to mention about what we've seen with Albion this year is that it had pretty high ratings of cold damage. Uh, the average was 2.5 in the fall. So this was moderate to severe. And we did observe that some of this damage was still present in the spring. And so we didn't see really good recovery on this variety. Let's move through and kind of look at some of the fruit set. You know, the plants are definitely smaller than what we would like to see. See some nice sized fruit, fruit starting to color up. Some nice fruit over here for sure. Um, some smaller green berries that'll be coming along soon. All right, let's move along to our next variety, which is uh, Liz. And this is a newer release, uh, released in 2019 from North Carolina State University in Gina Fernandez's program. It's a mid to late season and kind of seen as a replacement for Camarosa. Uh, it's said to be high yielding. One thing of note that we observed about Liz was that it had very low fall redder production, much less than Chandler, and that when we biomassed in the late fall and early winter, Liz was a close second behind Rocco with having the highest average crown weights, um, and it was not quite that double that of Chandler. And if we look through here, you know, you can kind of observe that, that the plants are pretty big and vigorous, a lot of good leaf biomass in there. If we move in and start looking at the flowers and fruit, uh, again, remember, this is a later variety, so we expect to see kind of a crop that's not quite as progressed as some of these other ones. Uh, but, you know, we see a lot of small green fruit in there, uh, a lot of fruit coming. Um, and so it does seem like it has a pretty heavy fruit set, which is exciting to see. Some early ripening berries that maybe just have another day or two to go. Uh, and a few blooms that we still see in here as well. So we're really excited to see kind of how Liz performs for us this year. And we'll continue to evaluate it through the season. Next up uh, is another North Carolina State Union release, um, released in 2019 also through Gina Fernandez's program. This is an early variety, kind of seen as a replacement for Sweet Charlie. Um, it's described as having good flavor and medium large berries. We again observed very low runner production on Rocco compared to other varieties, an average of 0 0.125 runners per plant. Um, so basically very few runners, about one runner per 10 plants compared to about 1.83 runners per plant on Chandler. 
Again, when we biomass sampled in the late fall and early winter, Rocco had the biggest crown weight averages uh, and about double that of Chandler. It averaged about 3.75 crowns per plant. Again, probably smaller number of crowns than we would like to see, probably going back to some of that cold damage. Um, and we did see some cold damage in Rocco in the fall, but basically no cold damage when we came back and checked again in the spring. So it did seem like there was some recovery. If we look down and look at some of the fruit set, you know, we've been harvesting up this variety for about two weeks, but we see, you know, still a lot of fruit coming behind and some nice uniform kind of berry shape. Um, I would say plants are maybe a little bit smaller than the Liz plants, but still a, a really nice showing of fruit and, and plant size. If we look at fruit, the fruit is kind of that nice conical shape and really dark red coloring through to the center, uh, no hollow on uh, this berry. Our next variety is Fronteras. This was released from the University of California in 2014. In previous trials, it had performed really well in Arkansas. It had slightly lower runner production in the Chandler, about 1.28 per plant. But one thing that you can kind of see when you look here at the plants is that we had really high ratings of cold damage. And so the plants are not quite as vigorous as we would like to see. It had average cold damage ratings of 2.5, so again, moderate to severe. And when we did not see recovery in the crowns when we checked them in the spring. So when we came back and co opened crowns again, average ratings was still three, which to me means that, you know, these, these crowns had some damage in the fall and those crowns did not really recover and, and that damage internally started to decay. But, you know, for the size of the plants that we see here, if we actually move in and start looking at the fruit, you know, the size of the fruit is really nice, really big fruit size, pretty berries, still a few small green fruit coming along, uh, not seeing a lot of flowers and buds on this. So we'll see how the numbers play out on this over time. One thing of note when we cut open the fruit is white in the center and there is some hollowing in the, in, in the center of the fruit on this berry. Next variety is Ruby June, released in 2014 from Lassen Canyon. You know, Ruby June is one that um, is known to have good quality fruit, very pretty berries. I would say that growers, at least here in the state of Arkansas, have seen kind of variable yields. Some report high, others have seen more moderate. We did see some cold damage on this variety in some grower fields this year. You know, when we assess the plants here uh, in our trial, it was sort of moderate damage, pretty comparable to a lot of the other varieties. And I think some of the reasons we were seeing more cold damage on this variety in other fields was possibly due to smaller plant size. And so those plants were not as hardy and able to withstand the cold. So I don't think that was something really specific to the genetics of this variety and possibly just more to small plant size, you know, and when we went through here, you know, decent sized plants, uh, not a ton of leaf biomass, but if we start looking at the fruit, you know, some nice uniform kind of medium sized berries, a few buds and blooms still coming along, giant fruits, especially when you go back and think about the size of the fruit on front terrace, but down here on this plant, really nice uh, showing a fruit set. And if we look at the internal fruit color, again, on Ruby June, uh, we do see some white internal flesh color. Finally, moving on to our last two, this one is Sweet Charlie. And of course, Sweet Charlie planted because it's early, though it's not necessarily really high yielding typically. I like this one a lot for flavor. Uh, we should we start of Florida in 1992. But you know, it's, when we look down in here and look at all the fruit that is being set, uh, you know, I think for, for Sweet Charlie, it's a pretty nice showing quite a bit of fruit, a lot of small green fruit still coming, but some nice bigger, you know, medium sized to large berries that are ready for harvest now. Again, this one going along with Rocco were our two earliest in this trial. We do see some hail damage uh, going here on that berry there. We'll see how Sweet Charlie plays out over the season. Internal fruit coloring, nice reddening into the edges of the fruit. And our last variety uh, is Camarosa. This is sort of the standard for pre-pick and production in some parts of the southeast. It has better shelf life than Chandler, which tends to get soft very quickly. Released out of the University of California in 1992, this is a variety that is not super widely planted in Arkansas, but we wanted to include it here because it's so widely grown in other parts. So far, nothing that has really stood out a whole lot about Camarosa. You know, it is a later season, so uh, a lot of the production is still coming. But when we look down in here, we are, do have a few ripe berries, pretty decent fruit set overall, and you know, kind of medium to large berries that are being ready for harvest now. Kind of maybe a little bit smaller plants than some of the other varieties. When we look at the fruit, the fruit does have nice red color through the center, possibly some hollowing in the middle.
So we are continuing to collect yield data and we do have each of these varieties planted in each of our four rows. Up next, we're gonna move down to the end of the field here and talk to Leslie and Alden who have been collecting data and work here at the vegetable station. And they're gonna give us some updates on what they think their favorite varieties are so far. And so we're looking forward to talking to them and hearing their feedback. Hi, I'm Leslie Smith. I'm one of the program associates here at the Vegetable Research Station. We've been harvesting strawberries for about two weeks now, and so far Rocco has been one of our favorites. The plant is nice and big, a lot of good green leafy growth, and the berries are big as well, and nice and in good flavor. My name is Alden Hotz. I'm a program associate here as well. Um, so far the Rocco has been exciting to eat. It's uh, matured early, so we've been, eating, been able to eat those for a while. Um, the Camino Real and the Fronteras are also looking good. They're uh, a little bit slower than the Rocco in maturing, but we look forward to the uh, harvest of those as well. The importance of this variety trial is to determine the success of these cultivars in a similar environment to what the growers in the state would see. To fully understand the success of these cultivars, we also wanted to see what type of disease susceptibility or tolerance may pop up in this trial. We didn't have the space in these trials to do true and treated plots to assess actual levels of tolerance or success for each cultivar, but we really wanted to see was if any problems existed when we used a solid fungicide prevention program. We'll be able to draw some comparisons from our untreated Chandler just one row over in another trial, and that should give us a good idea of what these fungicides provided for us. Let's talk about the diseases we really tried to focus on with these trials and what fungicide we use to prevent these. First, we applied Ritamil growth Gold through the drip irrigation right as new growth began in early March. We applied this because we were worried about the amount of rainfall we had already received, the future forecast, and how that may increase our risk for root and crown rot diseases called by fungus like Phytophthora, Rhizoctonia, or Vodicillium. Growers with a high risk of these diseases should use two applications, one after planting in the fall and one as soon as the plants start growing in the following year. In general, Rudimil Gold does the best job on diseases like Phytophthora. Other diseases may require different products. Rudimil Gold helps to protect new root growth from infection from many different uh, funguses. Control, cultural controls for these diseases include crop rotation, maximizing drainage, using raised beds, and proper irrigation. The other two diseases that we focused on our preventative spray schedule on were botrytis and anthracnose fruit rot. Botrytis fruit rot, also known as gray mold, is the most significant disease of strawberry foliage and fruit in Arkansas. Anthracnose fruit rot is a little less common, but we have seen a lot more of this disease popping up in the last few years. Spores from both Botrytis and Anthracnose are present on plants when they come in from nurseries. So disease prevention programs that use fungicides need to be practiced to minimize infection because growers are at a very high risk for this infection occurring considering the spores are already there. Strawberry is highly susceptible to both of these fruit rot diseases during bloom. All gray mold infection occurs from spores containing con contacting your blooms. Even though you may see a berry that is fully ripe begin to show signs of gray mold, this infection occurred while that berry was a flower, and the disease was dormant until sometime after ripening. This is why you can find moldy strawberries in containers at the store. All the berries looked healthy when they packed and shipped it, but the mold formed later. Anthracnose fruit rot also does the majority of its infection, or generally just the majority of its damage during the bloom period. Although it can infect green or red strawberry fruit, the critical timing is during bloom. This is why the fungicide program I'm going to talk about will focus especially on this bloom timing. One of the major diseases that we deal with a lot, and probably what most strawberry growers in the state will tell you is their most serious disease is gray mold. And I think you at home are probably most familiar with this disease as well. So here in our uh, plot where we're looking at Promax and Zap, we have a completely untreated, which just gives us a good opportunity to see a lot of disease occurring. So if you look here, we see a lot of uh, str strawberries that have a little bit going on, but especially what we see is this one strawberry that actually is showing symptomology for gray mold. And you can see where it really gets its name from. Generally, the disease will start at the very top of the berry and then work its way down. As you can see here, it's more severe at the top. And it's very iconic to see. And I think what this really shows you is that this disease can pop up at any, any time after disinfection in the flower. And so sometimes what you'll see is 
fully red berries that get the disease, or you get these small green berries that have actually gotten the disease and it begins to break down the berry. Or even you'll see a flower maybe that is infected and just doesn't even produce a fruit, where I think a lot of growers potentially miss this disease. Another disease that's very commonly dealt with in Arkansas, and what most people would say is the second worst disease, is arthracnose fruit rot. By worse, I mean prevalent and yield loss wise. And so um, what we see is uh, arthracnose fruit rot is that it damages the fruit, but also will, uh, can affect and damage flowers. And so during the flowering time is when you know, the best time to control to prevent this disease, but it can uh, infect green and red fruit. And so here what we have is uh, the disease presenting on some green and especially this red fruit here. We have circular lesions, so these are kind of sunken, sunken lesions, but really being circular where you can see those seeds kind of pop out on it. Um, you see here, especially on this green fruit, is what we look for when we're looking for this disease. Um, don't get it confused with things like bird or slug or hail damage. You used to be able to tell a little bit of a difference. Um, these circular brown lesions is really what you're looking for. Now let's talk about the fungicide spray program that we lined up for this trial. Talk about why we chose these fungicides. For this program, we really wanted to show that we could rotate fungicide groups, what we call EFRAC groups, and still minimize disease in our plots. We also know that many people across the state use very minimal spray programs, generally just consisting of captain alone, or maybe even very few sprays of captain. And this trial will give them and you as, as well a good idea of how our recommended spray program with good rotation would compare. Add this together with yield and timing data and you can be begin to paint yourself an accurate picture of expectations here in the state. This fungicide spray program relied on a few tenants. First, we wanted to get out an early cap 10 spray in the pre-bloom stage if it got warm and started raining early. As everyone watching probably knows, we had a very warm and a very wet early March. So we applied cap 10 about March 11th to slow down spore formation and prevent any risk of botrytis crown rot. Second, we didn't want to repeat applications of any two FRAC codes on the consecutive sprays. This is what we're talking about when we say rotating products. This is true for any fungicide that you use on strawberries except for captan or theorem. Older protective fun products like captan and theorem have a low risk of resistance and you can spray these consecutively. Third, we tried to maintain a seven day spray schedule that began at around 10% bloom and was based on projected rainfall. Whenever we could get a spray without a few a few days stretch of dry conditions, we use CAP10 alone or CAP10 plus Elevate. If rain was forecasted within 24 hours, and especially when many rain events were expected, we tried to maximize use of systemic fungicides that were less likely to wash away. You'll notice that we ended up really spraying on a five to seven day interval, and this was because of the excessive amount of rain events we were getting during peak bloom. We were worried about the amount of infection during this time, so we tightened intervals if two to three heavy rain events occurred after sprays, especially if we had used protected fungicides alone before that. You can see that we started off with our pre-bloom cap 10 spray and then immediately got into a good rotation with many systemic fungicides. So far we've rotated Luna Sensation, Switch, and cap 10 plus Elevate as our bloom sprays. If you look at the FRAC numbers of these products, you can see that we never use the same product twice and we have a wide variety of FRAC numbers used so far. This is important because this minimizes selection pressure from any one EFRAC group and lowers the risk of resistance and also our risk of fungicide application failures. The other important thing to notice is that all the fungicides we use for rotation are very effective for gray mold prevention and at least have some good activity for anthracnose prevention. It's important for all fungicides that you use, that you use to be, be effective at controlling these diseases because a rotated product has to be affected to help lower the risk of resistance. Really what you should take home from this is that a fungicide protective program is critical for profitable strawberry production and you need to put some thought into it to be successful. We want to prevent as much infection as possible which means application timing and watching the weather will be the key to success. Focus on preventing gray mold and anthracnose at a baseline and maximize cultural controls when possible. Check out the blogs that we put out on rain fastness for a better understanding of protectants versus systemic fungicides and how to decide which to use. So let's talk about another trial we have going here at the Keepler Station. This trial was funded by the Mid-American Strawberry Growers Association, and they wanted to better understand the value of two products which are typically used in rotation, Promax and Zap. These products are relatively understudied, and data on their potential to increase yield, flavor, and potentially decrease pests would be valuable for growers to make economically sound decisions. Growers typically apply these products through the drip line. After plants are transplanted into the field growers add Promax, which is a product with time well as the active ingredient. 
Two weeks later, ZAP is added. And this is a product that is a mixture of different fertilizers, such as nitrogen. When using these in rotation, the idea is that the time oil protects, the product helps to rid the soil of disease causing microbes, and the fertilizer based product then builds it back up. We tried our best to design this study in a way to test a lot of these potential benefits and see if it's what it's said to offer or holds any weight. To achieve this, we looked at four treatments. Two treatments received Promax and ZAP in rotation once each in the fall. Then we restarted that rotation once plants started putting on growth in the spring. One of these two will get preventative fungicide sprays and the other will not. The next two treatments received no Promax and ZAP and only one of these gets fungicides. That gives us a completely negative control with no products at all, a treatment with only Promax and ZAP, a treatment with only fungicides, and then finally a treatment with both fungicide sprays and the addition of Promax and ZAP. These treatments will allow us to fully compare the benefits of these products and how they can impact the prevalence of our common diseases. And in general, it's just gonna give us an idea if they're worth the wait. All plots are of the Chandler cultivar, and we sprayed treatments that received a fungicide application as part of their treatment on the exact same schedule as the variety trial I mentioned earlier. So basically when we sprayed the variety trial, we also sprayed the plots in this trial that received fungicide treatments, so which means they probably got a little bit of fungicide a little earlier since these are all Chandler and we started spraying that variety trial uh, kind of based on you know, some of our earliest varieties like Rocco. We did not apply Ritamil to any plot. We did apply that in the variety trial, but we were scared that it would uh, maybe a limit of what we can see here in this uh, other trial, and we weren't able to separate the plots up because the triple line went through all of them. We plan to measure all of the same metrics that we are in the variety trial. Marketable and coal yield, average berry weight, bricks, crown weight and number, general disease incidence, prevalence of anthracnose, prevalence of gray mold, and soil nematode numbers in the fall before application and in the spring during harvest. We also plan to do a taste test because there's some indication from some growers that they think it maybe enhances the flavor to some degree. We plan to share these results through our blog and at the Mid-American Strawberry Growers Association meeting. We hope that we can get multiple years of data with this project. We'd like to thank the Strawberry Growers Association for funding this project and in general just for their interest in wanting to know a little bit more about products they don't have, they can't find good unbiased research on. So we really thank them for reaching out to us and asking us, you know, put a little scrutiny to these products to see if they're worth the money they're spending on. All right. Next, we're going to go look at a strawberry planting date and fall row cover research trial we have going on in Clarksville, Arkansas. This trial is in its second year, and we are evaluating how planting date and the use of row covers applied at two different timings in the fall impact crop establishment, crown growth, and yields. Planting on time in the fall is well understood to be critical to allowing enough time for crown development on short day strawberries prior to them going into dormancy. This research is meant to help growers determine if applying row covers in the fall can help advance crop establishment and crown formation on late planted crops. Row covers may be applied to moderate cool nighttime temperatures and advance crop development. However, how planting date and the timing of row cover application in the fall interact to impact crown development and spring yields is not well understood. So to study this further, we implemented a trial in the fall of 2018. Chandler plug plants were planted on two dates, one being the on time on October 5th and the late being on Oct October 10th, about a week later. Subs subsequently, in both timings, we applied row covers, uh, the first being when the daily high temperatures averaged 65 degrees Fahrenheit and the second once daily high temperatures averaged 60 degrees Fahrenheit. We then left some plants completely uncovered. Uh, in 2018, the early set of row covers were applied in the third week of October and once daily high temps reached about 65. And the late row covers were applied the first week of November once daily high temperatures reached 60. Uh, in 2019, uh, last fall, the timings were pretty similar. Uh, the row cover weight that we're using is one ounce, and we did remove all row cover treatments uh, in early December. Uh, the trial you will see today is all planted in Chandler. I want to point out that our preliminary results from 2019 season found that the fall applied row covers can advance crown development and increase yields on late plantings. However, plantings where row covers were applied still don't yield as well as on-time plantings. And this makes sense because we can't make up for the lost daylight on late plantings, but row covers can help plants stay slightly warmer and growing for a longer period of time as nights cool in the fall. 
The on-time plantings all yielded similarly, regardless of row cover use, and so a row cover didn't really seem to advance crop establishment any further if plants were already planted on time. These results are indicative of the last seasons we've had in 2018-2019, where a major cold spell in about the two to three weeks after planting definitely impacted crop establishment in the fall. So how are we looking here at our second year of replicating this trial? Well, you remember we've talked a lot about this freeze that happened on Veterans Day, November 11th to 12th here in Arkansas, where we had major drops in temperature from 60s to 70s to the mid-20s across the state. Uh, and this was about four to six weeks after most people had planted and it sent a lot of our strawberry crops into kind of an early dormancy. So how are our different planting date and row cover treatments looking this year after that major cold event? Well, let's take a trip down I-40 uh, and you're to Clarksville, Arkansas, and you're gonna see two different videos uh, of kind of how those plants are looking. One from about uh, two to three weeks ago when we were biomass sampling, and another from about a week ago when we went through and started counting uh, blooms and buds. So let's get started down in Clarksville, Arkansas. All right, everybody, this is Dr. Amanda McQuart. I'm a horticulture specialist with the University of Arkansas. Today we're out here in Clarksville, Arkansas at our fruit research station looking at our strawberry uh, trial where we uh, had two different planting dates and then we applied row covers to these plants uh, at two different timings. Uh, and we also had a control group that never got a row cover at all in the fall. Uh, just from looking across these plots, you can see some pretty big differences in plant size. Uh, and that's kind of what we're trying to assess through our biomass sampling today. Uh, I'm going to walk over here to one of those first rows and kind of walk you through what we're seeing in the plants uh, plot by plot. So here in this first row, uh, this first plot of plants was planted in what we considered our on-time planting date. So this was before October 5th. Um, this plot also got a row cover applied to it um, sometime in early November uh, when the daily average high temperatures um, reach 65. Um, you know, plants look pretty good, maybe a little bit smaller than what we would like to see this time of year. Um, if we look at the data when we were pulling um, our biomass, we do count crown number. On this plot, we see that we have seven crowns per plant uh, on the plant sample that we pulled. This next plot next to it was actually planted about a week later. So I'm gonna come over here and see if you can see kind of general smaller size of these plants that are right next to it. Um, just that one week time difference in planting date. These guys still did get a row cover um, at that 65 degree date. So sometime in early November. If we look at what we see in terms of crown number, we only had one crown per plant on the plant that we pulled on this one. Um, so we'll be seeing how that plays out across the field, but definitely a visual difference, I think, in terms of how big the plants are just by delaying planting date that one week. This next plot um, was also planted on time, but got a row cover a little bit later than that first um, two plots. So these row covers were applied when the daily high temperature in the fall reached 60. So that was about a week to 10 days later uh, after that first row cover application. This plot was planted on time and its sister plot next to it here uh, was planted on that later planting date about a week later. Again, you can see pretty big size difference uh, between these two plots. Um, that later uh, planting date um, did still get that later row cover application. Uh, if we look at our data, this pl planting um, planted on time but had a little bit later row cover application, five crowns um, found in that plant that was pulled. And on this plant um, that was planted a little bit later was at four crowns. Our final plot back here um, is our plot that was planted on time but never got a row cover in the fall. And this guy back here was planted late and got no row cover at all in the fall. So you can see a pretty drastic difference um, as we move through these different plants. Um, this guy that was planted on time but got no row cover had three crowns. And this plant or plot back here uh, that was planted a week late and didn't get any row cover at all um, had two crowns. Now, uh, I do want to point out that we have four replications of this, so we're going to do the averages and the statistics across all. 
Um, but of course, as you look down this row, I think you can see a pretty clear kind of hop skip effect where um, our plants that got planted a week late um, are smaller than the ones that got planted on time. Um, it does kind of look like um, adding that row cover earlier in the fall on those uh, plots that are further down, so these plots and further back, did help with some plant size, considering that this plot that got planted the latest and got no row cover does appear to be the smallest for sure. Of course, um, you know, the fall is going to be very important to crown development. Um, and so I think this is, this is good information for us to have here in Arkansas about the importance of planting on time. Hey everybody, we're out here again at the Fruit Research Station looking at our strawberry planting date and fall row cover application trial. I just want to show you kind of what we're working on today. Uh, we are going through and counting how many buds, blooms, and green berries there are on uh, about five plants in each plot. Um, and we're seeing some pretty striking differences between our early and our late planting date. So for an example here, this is one of our late planting date plots. Uh, plants look pretty good. When we start to zoom in and look and do our bloom and berry counts, um, you know, we're seeing a couple green fruit in there, some buds still uh, about to open, a few blooms. Where, by contrast, if we go to one of our plots that is an on-time planting and kind of look down in the canopy to see what we see, we see quite a bit more green fruit, blooms, and buds. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that trip to Clarksville. As you can see, we're still seeing a really strong effect of planting date. And so kind of our take home message is that we still wanna try and plant on time, but if a situation occurs where we're not able to and we're delayed, a one ounce row cover applied a few weeks after planting in early October can help uh, advance crop establishment and hopefully contribute to increased crown development in the fall. We are still continuing to collect yield data on this trial and we're hopeful to have those results compiled later this summer to give you a better understanding before we move into the fall planting season for the 2021 strawberry season. Thanks so much for watching.